To begin today's show, I'll be joined by my American Medicine Today radio co-host, Ethan Euchre. Thanks, Kimberly. Putting together pieces of a puzzle is what our next guest did while training as a medical examiner in New York City. Dr. Judy Melanick's book, Working Stiff, Two Years, 262 Bodies, and the Making of a Medical Examiner, explores homicides, suicides, and the many other ways the human life can end. Hey, Judy, first off, of course, I have to ask, what made you decide to get into such a macabre profession as forensics? And she's actually calling right. us from the morgue right now. Oh. So. Well, from my office. It's adjacent to the morgue. But uh, Same thing. I went into forensics because initially I was drawn to medicine because my father was a physician, and he inspired me to study medicine, and I was always in, law, in love with science and all of the human body. But I didn't know exactly what subspecialty I would want. I started off in surgery, and the second chapter of Working Stiff details my experience doing surgery, and even though I loved operating, the hours required of the residency training just exhausted me, and I was not happy doing that. So I switched to pathology because I had had some experience with that when I was a medical student. But it you know, wasn't as exciting to me until I found forensics. Being able to wake up every day and open the paper and see what happened and then go into the morgue and get the real story, wow. that was what was exciting for me. Now, you say in here a medical examiner doesn't fall out of the womb all-knowing. because, And I think <laughs> you're relating that more or less to how it's portrayed on TV. Mm-hmm. That is correct. I think that television shows, whether it is Uh, crime uh, dramas such as CSI or NCIS, or even reality-based shows like 48 Hours of Forensic Files, first of all, they give everybody the impression that all forensic pathologists do are homicides, suspicious deaths, and really those are only about 10% of what we do. Most of Working Stiff is meant to give the reader a better grasp of what we actually do, and the remaining 90% are things like accidents or suicides or even natural deaths that are unexpected, not necessarily anything violent or suspicious. So that's why it was important for me to write this, to give people a correct perspective of what things are really like. Well, and a lot about the book apparently is sort of chronicling your first year, your rookie mm-hmm. season, if you will, uh, working in New York City of all places to start out um, with just the craziness that goes on up there. Two months in to your new profession and boom, 9-11 happens. I mean, th- that must have been just describe that day for you and what that must have been like. So 9-11 was obviously something none of us could have expected or predicted. I was just going into a routine day. I was actually supposed to be shadowing someone in the toxicology lab, I believe, that day. And I saw the first plane as it flew over my head before it hit the World Trade Center, and I didn't recognize what it was initially. It was only after the news reports came in a few minutes later that I realized I had seen the first plane. The... The experience of being at the medical examiner's office during such a time was overwhelming. I mean, it was overwhelming for everybody involved, including the experienced professionals I was working with, but all the more so for someone like me who had just started and only had two months of experience. It was important for me to put that towards the end of the book, though, because I want people to understand that it's not a 9-11 book. It's a book about forensic pathology training. And clearly, I couldn't ignore that part of my training. But you can't really wrap your head around the response to a multi-fatality incident without understanding what a pathologist does on a day-to-day basis. Right. Now, what do you say that the body never lies? I don't say that. That's what Dr. Hirsch says. And it's a wonderful saying because it tells you that the dead body is really the one who is giving you the information. I mean, people say to me, oh, your job must be so much fun. Your patients never complain and they don't talk to you and you don't have to deal with that. But ultimately, my patients, when you're dealing with the deceased individuals, Mm -hmm. they do talk to me, but they talk to me by showing me their wounds or their injuries or internally their natural disease. And Judy, I got to imagine you've seen so many insane, just strange things. Mm -hmm. Can you give us maybe some of the strangest ones or the most odd ones? And there's probably a lot of history of involved in some of these two where it's your job to figure out what happened to these people any good stories like that one of the cases in working stiff involves a drug user who uh, had been found dangling out of a window and then collapsed and when the 
uh, first responders came to the scene, there was actually a fire in the residence, and one of the firefighters was attacked by another person with a knife. So then there was a question of, well, did this guy go out the window out of his own volition, or was he trying to escape a knife-wielding person? And he did have what looked like stab wounds on his arms. But then when we went back to the scene, we discovered that there were also big shards of glass through that window. And with further investigation, we found out that he basically escaped out of his own volition. It was an accidental death, essentially, not a suicide. He was escaping the fire, and it was not a homicide. And I was also reading in your bio, Judy, that you were a consultant on some pretty high-profile legal cases. Any that we might know or our, our viewers and listeners might know of? Well, right now, ever since the book's come out, I've been contacted repeatedly by the press any time that there's an in-custody death, um, such as Michael Brown or Freddie Gray, and then most recently Sandra Bland, who um, apparently hanged herself in jail. The reason I'm getting contacted more than anything is because often medical examiners and coroner's offices don't have a public relations staff or don't feel comfortable talking to the press. Mm -hmm. And because I've had experience not only speaking to the press about my book, but just being able to explain the complicated medicine in simple words that people can understand without dumbing it down, that gives me an opportunity to really be a spokesperson for my field and hopefully draw more students into it, because that was my intention in the first place, is to get more students to study forensic pathology. What would you say is the biggest takeaway from your book? What is the biggest misconception about forensics and the life of a medical examiner that you want to impart to the public? Because we only know what we see on Mm -hmm. TV and CSI and things like that. What are the biggest misconceptions? I think the biggest misconception is the assumption that somehow what I do is morbid, horrible, and macabre. Um, People always ask me, what what drew you to this field? It's so yucky. And really, anybody who works in death investigation, whether it's a death investigator or a forensic pathologist or even grief counselors who sometimes work with the bereaved, realize very quickly that by helping people understand death, they can actually appreciate life so much better. That when you read Working Stiff, it's not just about the dead bodies. It's about us. It's about the living. And it's actually a really life-affirming book and a life-affirming story. Well, thank you for taking the time to share your insight with us. Judy Melnick, forensic forensic pathologist and author of The Working Stiff, Two Years, 262 Bodies, and the Making of a Medical Examiner. Thanks, Judy. Appreciate it.